watching and we are live with Julia Parnell from Notable Film, Notable Pictures. Notable pictures, I got it. Julia, hi. Hi, kia ora. Hey, uh, friend of the show. You know, I like being able to say when people come back, friend of the show, friend yeah. of the show, friend of the show. Um, and you are back in Dunedin because of the um, world exclusive. Was it the world premiere of 616? No, actually, the world premiere was on an aeroplane from Auckland to Dunedin. My father sent me a clip of Coro Lounge people who got it and they got to see it on the way. De when did they see that? That was on Saturday, last Saturday. <laughs> uh, yeah, so they got to fly to Dunedin watching the premiere of... Mm -hmm. well, I got to watch it mm -hmm. because your team were lovely enough to send me a um, screener. Property of notable pictures across it, lovely emblazoned over it, but it is fan-fucking-tastic. Okay. It is a great, great, great picture. Mm -hmm. But we were just saying, you have a bit of an affinity with Dunedin, because there's the chills that we talked about, <laughs> and a little bit of advertising. The chills that we talked about, I don't know, it feels like 10 years ago because One of COVID. One year ago. Was it only a year ago? Like yeah. literally 12 months we were talking? We released it in May last year. Holy moly. I know. It feels like another lifetime. It kind of does feel like another lifetime. I'm and quite tired though, you know, coming off. Two movies back to back and big series and COVID. Yeah, I'll try not to fall asleep in this interview. Though. Oh, that would be plenty. Drink up of your mandarin <laughs> lime <laughs> bitters. That'll that'll keep you going along. Um, so look, we appreciate your time. We know we're limited today, so um, you know how we roll. We kind of flowery get around to it. So let's just get into it. Let's just get into the thing. Um, your time frame for this. Because we talked about this documentary when you were with us last time. So obviously there's at least a kind of 18-month window. But your time frame, as I'm watching it, I'm thinking, how much of this footage is you guys? How much is it stock footage? You know. So what was the time frame that you got on board with for this documentary? And for people who don't know, it's sort of the, um, the story of 660. But it is sort of the all-encompassing. It's not like, let's do this tour. It's not like about Western Springs. It's the all. It's the story of them from kind of start to finish. A lot of footage of it. Obviously, the boys had phones or whatever, and they recorded themselves in their flat or whatever it was. I'll tell you where that footage. Okay, came so from. tell us, tell us where so, you got involved and and that, that sort of thing. Well, I got involved. Um, I would say it was around February 2018 that we started talking about things. I know it must have been a little bit before that because I knew about the. So they had just done a tour and it was very successful and they were a part of my um, Anthems series, a six-part right. music series I made for Prime. Um, so I met them. I knew that they were interesting because they came into the room and started saying things that I didn't expect. I was expecting... Like well, they just felt... They were just talking about how hard it had been and that, you know, they hadn't really talked about what they had been through to get where they were. I was expecting we would be doing an interview that was pretty, you know, straight down the barrel about, you know, how to write a great pop song and what their connection has and the story. Where do you, where do you find story. your hooks? Where do they come from? Yeah, well, sort <laughs> of, you know. Um, but it, they just, I was really quite captivated by it. It was Marlon and Machu, so keyboards and um, vocalist, guitar. And... Um, that sort of started a conversation. They had been, had they had camera people around them, you know, as you do when you're a band these days. Yeah. So there was footage that they had been gathering over time and they were making lots of little kind of cute social things. So there was footage that was being gathered, but I mean, it wasn't being shot for narrative, but, but, but cool for cool vision. Um, but I probably took about, you know, it takes about 18 months to get funding. So you start filming yourself you know, you're spending your own money kind of thing. And then, so you hustle, hustle to try and bring all the finance together and win everybody over. So I think once I was, I really, it all started from about the day of the Western Springs concert. Right. And that footage of the Western Springs concert in the doco, is that you guys? Yes, yeah. That's wicked. Thank you. And it's lovely, it's a lovely narrative to go from, you know, the these, these images of them rehearsing in the backspace or even the early days then into seamlessly into them playing in front of 50,000 people at the same time. It's wicked. Yeah. It's, it is really, I mean, I don't want to blow smoke. I'm not about that, but it's, you know, I watch, I watch a lot of documentaries and I often talk about, I like watching the creative process. So things like South Park, Six Day to Air, uh, things like the Foo Fighters back and forth, uh, even movies like um, the one with Tom Hanks where he's making Mary Poppins, things that describe a creative process really resonate with me. And I kind of got that vibe from this documentary. I was watching the, um, the, the 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 building of this band, 
and um i was thinking and like it's really hard to sound not patronizing when you kind of say this but it's like i just thought right then this is the first time i've thought about this it's like they're the little engine that could you know it's like the i think i can i think i can i think i can but it's like they're the most successful underachieving band in the world and they're not underachieving that's the reason it's trying hard to explain this but you look at everything they've done if you measure their success by industry standards they're like oh yeah they're okay if you measure their success by engagement with their audience they're like the biggest band in the world and it's a weird juxtaposition even like i was looking at their twitter accounts today you know much who's got five and a half thousand followers that doesn't seem like the right number of followers for the lead singer of the biggest pop band in a country that sells out fifty thousand. do you know what i mean it's, and this, this is part of the journey i've now started on since watching your documentary about who these guys are and their story they are really quite unusual in many ways and i think um audiences fans and non-fans will be really surprised I certainly have been um, they just didn't follow the traditional pathway of the music industry but just to kind of come back to what you said about industry standards their album has now been in longer in the charts than Dark Side of the Moon Pink Floyd and I mean I, wow. I'd have to even Google to remember how many weeks well, that look, is. Let, let me just look, take one step back because I actually think you're right because there's that when I say beautiful part, I was shocked of the documentary talking about the night they won more twoies than the person who won less. Than the, I won't spoil it too much. And the person who won fewer twoies than them got all the press. So they have received industry praise, but it's like they haven't been accepted by the mm -hmm. industry. That's kind of what I'm meaning, you know. Obviously, the, they have, they haven't, they've had number one hits, but not like you know. I mean, Lord's different because she was America as well. But every song was hers was number one mm -hmm. for a while, and so they've they've. It's almost like they're, and this, even though they're the biggest band in New Zealand, they're still underground. It's this, you know what I mean? It's really uh, hard uh, to figure and out. And I think that's really part of why they've been so successful. Right. I mean, I did set out to try and work this out. <laughs> <laughs> like, why are 660 so crazily popular? Like, what is this pop music? What is it about these five men who are pretty damn down to earth? Yeah average blokes in many ways um trying to figure that out i don't i've certainly got theories and and my hypothesis is definitely that it's their backgrounds and the fact that they didn't try to do it the way other people did and they have sort of followed their own instinct but they come from very uh kiwi uh I don't know. They, they, there's something in each of their backgrounds that speaks to who we are as New Zealanders, and I think that's part of it. But they just, they weren't chasing what musicians usually chase. They came from the rugby. It was like, it's a, it's a desire to achieve that is more akin to professional sports than to musicians don't get me wrong they're obviously chasing writing great songs yeah, yeah. but um there's a, a mentality and i spent more time talking to people like gilbert anoka um joseph parker and people like that trying to understand a bit more about this band there, there was a point though and i think it um was it Hawani who was the original was bass player um where there's a conversation and you show it in the documentary where one of the boys goes what do you want he goes i want to play for the mighty all blacks you know what do you want i want to fill stadiums so there was a point oh, where yeah. they went you know not following the path but i was surprised how much like it seems that their their most successful times including now moving on is when they've done stuff outside the industry standard I mean, like, who the fuck would sell out 50,000 at Western Springs? That's ridiculous. And I remember when that came out, I remember seeing it in the media, and they were so low-key about it. They were like, oh, you know, we're lazy. So we only want to do one. You know, great, great Kiwi attitude sort of thing. Um, but then again, they did still get signed by a label and went to Berlin. And then they got signed by a label and they went to LA. So it's kind of like they've tried to do it the way you're supposed to. It hasn't really worked. And once they're finally taking control of it themselves and done it the way they want to, that's when their greatest success, however people measure that. Well, you know, I was talking to Greg Johnson in our previous iteration of this podcast when we're in our old building where you came to. And financially speaking, he was talking about 660 doing, you know, the the stadium, the Western Springs. And he's got, he's like, that's house purchasing money, you know, that they're making off one gig. And I'm like, that's awesome, you know. And so however you measure the success when they seem to do things 
the way they want to do it and outside what they're being told to do. It reminds me a bit of South Park. Mm. You know, those guys just breaking all the boundaries and being hugely successful. That's when they are the most successful, but it feels like the story of their success is the byproduct. You know, like the, they're doing what they're doing and it's getting success rather than chasing success so they've found the mold. Yeah. Um, I think that a lot of strategy and thought is, is put into it. I mean, they, they really um, deeply consider what they're going to do. I mean, I think the, their current manager, John Riley, played a big part in this sort of starting to take these more audacious um steps and that western springs gig was as much about getting you know making the world take notice because breaking out of new zealand and the algorithm is of the, the spotify algorithm and now we're in a tiktok world where yeah. Really, songs are being bought off choruses. Kids hear a song and they don't even recognize it till they get to two lines like of super, the chorus. Like Super Lonely. Yeah. Yeah. So it's such a different time. So that partly that Western Springs thing was about, hello, we can do this. You need to take notice. And that got them signed again. But was it was it like a middle finger? Like, was it like a fuck you, we'll just do it our ways, we'll show you what we can do? Or was it like a let's just do it and see what happens? I think there is different. I don't, I mean, there is an attitude, a general attitude of "if you, I'm going to do it." Like that is a bit what they're like. Yeah. And I explore some of that arrogance in the film, and I think some of that, that, um, and there's a tie-in even with with Martin Phillips with my last film, just really, really ambitious people who are will who will stop at nothing. Right. You know, and what that actually can do to relationships. And um, I really was trying to understand how this quest for success that 660 have had um, has also impacted them and uh, on, on an individual level, but in a, as a band, it's been hard to stay together. Yeah, and that, that was really, um, well, it's a bit shocking actually, to be honest with you. And I was thinking, I don't know whether it's a testimony to perseverance or pig-headedness or I don't know, this is probably wrong to say this, but like laziness, you might as well just stay with who we've got, you know, just whatever it is. But uh, Certainly wasn't laziness. Yeah, they yeah, would. okay. Um, I, I, I have to say, though, what uh, it's always interesting to talk to the person who's made the narrative because I don't know if it was meant to look this way, but, um, you know, I was in Dunedin when the balcony incident happened, and, and I can say that without spoiling because people know about the balcony incident, but the footage that you've got in that, thing I it was really emotional and really horrible to watch because you know what happens from it I guess as a father of teenage kids and you know they'll be at university soon and that kind of stuff it was really hard to watch but it's I, I knew I was going to ask you this question and I'm, I've been trying to figure out how to ask it in a gentle way on the way through but it seems that the one of the results of that that falling balcony was the band becoming closer and becoming more of a unit because a lot of how the documentary showed it which is why i want to take on this is a lot of that separation conflict sort of not being able to fit together as well as happening before it but after the balcony it seems that that it went away and i just thought gosh is that a part of their growth together and how does that sit on someone as a band when there was a terrible outcome from that accident but if part of it is bringing the band together you know what i mean like how does that then sit um, look, I think throughout that period, those few years, see that happened. I mean, they, it has felt a bit to me that they just had knockback after knockback and they tried and they did all they could to stay together because they do love each other. Mm. Um, and there's certain members of the band who I think really put a lot of effort into keeping people together as well. But, um, and that moment it was interesting. I actually didn't realize how much that moment had impacted on them wanting to stay together and to change until a little bit later on in the process. Wow. And I, um, sh I did show that section to Machu, um, and he was very upset, um, crying watching it i think he still cries every time you watch it also his father cries so i think when you see your dad cry that when you're 
you know, macho blokes. Yeah. It's quite hard. But um, when Mutt said, you know, we couldn't let it end on that. We couldn't let it end wow. on that. Uh, but it sort of, I think, you know, from my perspective, looking in and having done many, many interviews, hours and hours and hours of interview, I can see that that was a turning point of change that took a few years to okay. play out. And there was still a lot of things that needed to be worked through. And at some point in that journey, um, they really did reach out. They started learning about philosophy. I, I could have had a whole section of the film about all the personal self um the self-affirmation work they did or the self-improvement work that they did, it, I think is really to be commended. I mean, like getting uh, Gilbert Anoka, the All Blacks mental coach, in to talk to them mm. and other people. And so I think that um, they are to be admired for the fact that they're willing to say where they've gone wrong. Um, and the fact that they're especially much who was so... Uh, willing to say that to me on camera mm. you know just is it ever good enough I just don't know you know he's he's it's like a torture really isn't it when you just want when you're great and you've got greatness but is it ever enough <laughs> you know is that even even um much you're doing Song that lyric. is that even um part of the evidence that they're still outside what you're supposed to do mm. like you because they're not holding back on sharing their thoughts because yeah and in, in, in the documentary with the emotion showing I oh, I was watching the documentary feeling that emotion like I was I, I was welling up you know and it's like it's it just I don't know life especially this year is so weird sometimes that that you know you feel like you get hit down three times and lifted up once and if the 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 thing I was thinking is if a horrible tragedy like that can be one of the catalysts one of one of the segments of what enables you to get lifted up is just it's a it's a tragic yet fascinating part of the story. I um I am very proud of how honest they have been. I, there's so many factors now, and I try. I mean, I'm obviously I'm doing interviews and press and things like that, and a lot of people are talking to me at the moment because they're doing all these premieres. But I can't quite know how that happened it's a combination obviously of my skill <laughs> ability mm. to get people to talk but I think it was the right time and actually they weren't in a great place when I met them right um and was able to perhaps be a part of the change that was happening and it maybe even contribute by having a documentary they're asking all these questions it, uh, it forced them all to kind of consider each other's point of view because I, I guess when sometimes. you've got that camera pushed in your face you've got to kind of go shit what do I uh, think not that I that? push a camera in anyone's my, face. sorry for being so clunky <laughs> with my, uh, my 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 verbiage there but you know they're kind of put in a position where they have to then yeah. stop and think so yeah of course that's going to be a yeah and I mean to be honest they have said that that how um, fabulously cathartic the process has been what do you think of I mean you've done a few of these now what do you think of the music industry I'm interested to get your take on you know watching watching with them for two or three years yeah and then also researching their own footage and their own stories about um you know that because because the other thing I thought and it's ironic in this year of 2020 that we're doing everything by ourselves at home in our studios that surely that you got to come to LA and record in our studio. Why hasn't that died? Like, why would you take a band of seven people to LA to record in a studio? We've got perfectly good recording, you know, capabilities in New Zealand. And if you want a producer, you can bring. You know, it's like, how do you feel about the music process and how that works in this day and age? Do you think that this year is going to give us a a new way of doing it, like so many other things, like working from home and that sort of thing? I don't know. I think there's still something to be said when you're it's the collaboration if you if you're an artist and you're um wanting to make the best pop music in the world you don't just have one producer you work with multiple people mm. collaborators look and probably not taking the whole band over or you are only taking the whole band for some of it um i you know i i can only imagine i mean i want to 
tr- you know, I want to be out there in the rest of the world again. I mean, I think that, you know, we're not going to be able to go to film festivals and all that kind of stuff. I mean, that international collaboration is super important. But as I said before, read TikTok. It's really challenging times for the live industry, particularly. Um, if you think about what a decade ago the stadium bands that we used to have mm. who can do that now and these artists who are doing tiktok songs they don't know how to perform in the same way so it's a very very different time for music and i think that makes me a little bit sad so uh, you've kind of preempted my next question normally when there is a, a change in how things are done it's either a good change a bad change or just a change change like a new way of doing things you you not you don't like I mean not seeing you two at um at, at Wembley anymore mm. but but seeing you know artist X for eighteen seconds on TikTok is a is a, is a sad and bad move in the music world. Well, I not bad bad as bad as a relative word, but you know what I mean. I mean, who who am I to judge what how much kids are loving something? I'm just saying mm. that connection to music is really changing, and it makes it hard for the music industry to be selling so like they have to sell songs on TikTok, which I can only imagine what that's like. I think since since we've kind of moved into the digital age of Spotify and you know all, all those other various similar ones, those big bands have made their money from touring, though, haven't they? Anyway. I mean, I mean, talking about our conversations before, seeing what Martin from the Chills has been doing and getting that docket every now and again, talking about how much they're still in debt from the, the way things used to be mm. and how they're doing them from here. And I wonder if maybe that's where doing things in a new way in this new world is. But I guess what I hear you saying, and correct me if I'm wrong, is working with collaborators, you go to the collaborators. And if there's 20 people you want to collaborate with, they happen to be in and around Los Angeles, that's why you go to Los yeah. Angeles. Yeah, that's yeah. right. Yeah, well, well, I was I was thinking about things like South by Southwest and that because that's obviously part of the chill story as mm-hmm. well. How does um, we had a New Zealand Film Festival and we were involved a little bit with them and they did a bunch of online stuff. What happens to this movie in twenty twenty in this crazy year where, as we speak, being so lucky to be in New Zealand? I talk about having not male privilege or white privilege, but New Zealand privilege. <laughs> this privilege that I've done nothing to earn, you know, but just happened to be here at the moment. What happens to this for doing the rounds of various um, festivals? Well, we, I mean, hopefully we are successful and are accept, accepted into film festivals, but it's always been, this movie is about New Zealand. I, I wasn't... You know, it's not it's not make something for an international audience or don't make it for an international audience because we, we want to connect with international audiences and it would be fabulous. And if we got into a film festival, well, it would just play online and they geo-block to those territories. That's cool. But at the moment, I'm just so thankful that we're bringing it out in New Zealand and Australia on the same day next oh, cool. week on Thursday. The 26th. The 26th, that right? yep. yeah. And we've we've been travelling around the country doing these hometown premieres, Dunedin last night, Napier the night before, Invercargill, we've got uh, Whangarei on Saturday. So I just wanted to give it to New Zealanders mm. and to fans in Australia at the moment. That's, that's the most important thing to me. So this feels like that, what, is this more of a... I don't want to be a wanky say gift in New Zealand, but does this feel different from a commercial production for you? Uh, no, I mean, everything, you you know, there is financial responsibilities. Yeah, um, I've got investors. Um, and look, we, you know, if people turn out to the cinema to watch it, we could do well. But I mean, you just don't know. It's a really, um, it's, just, it's a risk. Any film. What I'm perhaps saying, and, I, and when I was watching it last night, I thought, man, I have made a pop movie. <laughs> I made my, you know, I really, it feels quite pop. It's, it's, it's really hooky and fast. <laughs> um, so, you know, it actually probably is my most commercial right. work I've ever done, really. <laughs> If we're honest, but we, I just, but I, I do hope that you know, we we were pushed out th- twice, um, waiting for to get this out because of COVID, um, so it's been a long time coming, and a lot of people have really had had to stick by me in this movie and and keep re doing the work like we what what, what do you mean stick by you Give, like, to explain like, that for well me. you know people come on board to distribute it or mm. you know and there's a there's a find out usually you've got that finite 
amount of time or money that's going to be put behind it. But when you have your film pushed twice, right? You know, and the rules keep changing. I don't mean the rules of of you know. I guess just the the way that um, we should market the movie or or we've made all these plans, all these assets and they need to all be changed and, you know, just meetings after meetings for months and months to get to this point. Mm. So um, I feel very privileged that I've had so much support and that's come from Universal Music and Studio Canal. Universal Music, do they there also therefore try and open up doors, obviously in America? Is that like well, they, they, they're a subsidiary and they have other connections into the no, t- no so that so um, they so Universal Music are uh, um, distributed they've never distributed a film before but oh, wow. because they um, are the band's uh, record label in New Zealand they've come on board and understand the band um, but they are very much doing it for in support of me and the movie Mm -hmm. Um, and it has felt like that every step of the way I've been very lucky you know it's not been a traditional approach and and so I think that's right for a 660 story yeah of course and is that Universal Music are they kind of a New Zealand subsidiary of the bigger one or or will this be getting seen by the executives in in LA as well well I mean uh, no because it's still it's uh, it's still music actually the rest of the world is Sony for for, um, 660 so we will get more support from them for international approach. So uh, at the moment, we're really just focused on New Zealand and Australia and start thinking through. We've got some premiere plans coming through, but we definitely need to wait for a little bit longer. And as the filmmaker, what's your what's your takeaway from this movie? Like, What have you come away from it with? I mean, surely every time we're on a journey, we, we learn stuff, we mm-hmm. grow. We what, what did you get when you were doing this movie for you? I, you know, I have been inspired to have bigger goals. Um, even, and, and their manager is a very interesting character and um, John Riley, he's a New Yorker. Um, and he's, seeing how he works has also given me cause to, to think about what it actually means to negotiate and hustle. Wow. <laughs> um, I'll do it in maybe a, a less, I'll do it in a slightly more Julia, quiet, loving way though, John. <laughs> if you see listens to this. Um, I like to hustle with heart in my way. Anyway, but I think, you know, the belief that I can, and and the support that they've given me to believe if I do the best job I can with this movie that it can be another stepping stone for my own growth. Right. So I've enjoyed that. I think I've learned a lot more about pop music. Um, not quite a snobby anymore? I'm not quite a snobby about <laughs> pop music. How could you tell that I am snobby about pop music? I didn't know. Just You said something about, I finally, I finally <laughs> done a pop movie. Like it's like, like I, I cleaned it off the bottom of my shoe and I finally <laughs> held it up for people to see. <laughs> I know, hilarious. Um, yeah, what can I say I, with my little... Anyway. Um, <laughs> yeah, I did. I've, I get it a bit more now. That doesn't mean I don't I go home and listen to Pink Floyd for two two hours or Leonard Cohen for two hours just to kind of recalibrate. Decompress. <laughs> recalibrate. Yeah, 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 for sure. <laughs> um, for you personally as well, you've just said this is, who knows if it goes well, could be a stepping stone. Where? Where do you want to go? Well, I just want to, I'm loving it so much. It's so, it's, I love doing, I love, you know, the, the craft of storytelling, factual storytelling. Being in that edit suite, it's the one of my most happiest really? places. Yeah. I mean, I like being out and directing and, and doing that too, but it's kind of trans, like you, you've you got this day and there's all the stress to get there and organize everything and write all your scripts and, you know, and and um, there's also an element of you don't know what's going to happen on the day um, and the universe delivers and I do enjoy that part of it. But once you're in the edit suite mm. and it's just you and your, and your editor and I've had a very, it's the same editor for all my work cool. for like the last seven years. Um so we've got a very cool relationship. So just trying to nut out that story and um, I don't know, it's really, it's it's hard mahi, but, mm-hmm. but very gratifying. And are you someone who like is hands on with the edit? In other words, do you do editing yourself? No, or no, Or do no. you sit in the director's chair and say, I want this, I want this, I want this? It's, I mean, it's a flow. There'll be days when I'll be like, um, I want to try this and he'll be like, no, I don't want to. And I'm like, yes, we're going to. 
<laughs> and, oh, we'll have a disagreement about it. No, but uh, Dion, he's a beautiful editor too. I actually really love handing over. I mean, uh, and I would talk to him before my shoots and stuff as well. So hopefully he knows what I'm trying to achieve. Um, but you sort of hand over that footage and he can do rough cuts and you know, there's some phases when you're just sitting next to each other battling over one shot and other days when it's just about trying to put, um, you know, ideas together. It depends, really. So your your happy place being in the edit suite, that sounds like, because um, I know I've got friends who just love getting in on their Pro Tools or their Adobe Premiere or whatever and just making it perfect, you know. But then they're, they're the physical making it. It sounds like you kind of as a director sitting in the edit suite directing that is the happy place. Is that what you, is that was yeah. that where you're at? Because yeah. I was thinking about could you then apply that to other things that weren't your own product? That implies there basically your happy place is in the edit suite as a director of your own content. Would that be fair to say? Sure, sure, sure. Yeah, sure. I, that that is that is the gift, you yeah. know, to tell your own story. But you know, I have my loading docs project where we're giving feedback on other other people's edits, and I do. But I do know that usually in my life, I find it hard. Like say, say we're collaborating on a piece of writing or something, a script or something. I have to be the one to type it. And I have to be. I'm such. I, I guess I'm vaguely control freakish. I try really hard not to be, but um, when it comes to editing, actually, it's quite good to just be able to sit in somebody yeah. else's mind and then walk away and then come back in with fresh eyes um, or take it home, watch it on the screen. I've got a, a web series for TVNZ On Demand that I'm making at the moment on the Wire to Anthems co-papa. Um, you know, last year when, when 660 and others, Benny, um, Shapeshifter, translated songs into Treo, yeah. uh, the album was number one. It was really fabulous. So I'm doing a round of short documentaries on that at the moment. So I'm in that process. At the moment, to the, as of today, I've decided I hate everything. And I'm going, I just don't even know what I'm going to do. So I'll have to just go back. You know what I mean? It's just a weird sort of flow in the edit, trying to make it amazing. Totally. One day you love it. Next day, like, oh, it's not good enough. <laughs> have you seen Six Days to Air? The no. South you, should, you should watch it because what you're talking about describes sort of, I think, all of the creative process. Because you've got Trey Parker and Matt Stone. And they make South Park in six days. And normally on about the Sunday, one of them is saying, this is the worst thing I've ever made. It's a piece of shit. And then, but at that point where Trey's down, um, Matt's high. And then Matt thinks it's the worst thing. And then Trey's high. And then by the end of it, they're sending it off to Comedy Central with 20 minutes to spare sort of thing. And it's yeah. obviously it's genius because they're geniuses. But that thing about this is the worst thing I've ever done. And, Why yeah, do we I, have to have that? It's so annoying. It's weird, eh? But then again, the flip side as well, I think, I know for, for me and what I'm doing, and nothing like what you're doing, but with when I try and create something or do something, I'm my own worst critic. So I'm, I go, like if I come out of a podcast and I go, fuck, that was an awesome podcast. Most of me knows that it was a really good podcast because I'm really hard critic. I imagine that you, when you look at something and you're happy with it, that must mean it's it's the shit. <laughs> I don't know about that, maybe. But you know what I mean? Yeah. Because, because I mean, I don't know if... I'm going to take that, though. You can take it, yeah. <laughs> take it and run with it. Because that's what I feel. I feel like creative people who are hard on themselves get good content, whatever that may be. So if those hard people are happy with their content, it's a level above what would be acceptable to someone else. It's, I can't, I mean, it's such a crazy privilege, my job. Like, how lucky am I to do what I do? You know, to get to go to the places, to sit down and really drill questions, you know, explore humanity. And that's what I swear, explore humanity for a job. Yeah, I look. <laughs> How do you say this? I, I get that it's a privilege. I understand, I understand what you're saying, but there's a there's hard grind. Oh, yeah. It's not like no one's given this to you on a platter. <laughs> you know, there's that old adage. In fact, they just try and make stop you all the time. <laughs> <laughs> there's that old adage that some the unfortunate thing in life is some people who think they've had a home run don't acknowledge they started on third base. You know, like the, the, this is not something that that someone's handed to you. And so I I, I agree. And 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 on many people who I guess are creatives or creating something. You know, I often think about, you know, I shot up, I shot up to Central yesterday to pick up some couches for off Trade Me, and I was able to do that in part because of the job that I have and the way that I work and the the thing, and that's a that is that other people can't do that, and I feel really lucky and blessed. But equally, you know, in this current day and age, it's been a really hard year, and we've had to make decisions to cut back on things and you know I'm operating today by myself when I used to have somebody and I've bought the studio home and built it here rather than that big thing we had when you were with you last time 
so it's not it's not like it's a hard graft it's a hard graft and i think we should be celebrating and kiwis are fucking terrible at it <laughs> but we should be going and i've just i've just had robbie nickel on i just talked to him about this i'm repeating myself in the space of three hours uh, we should be celebrating our successes in a year where most things that we thought we'd do 12 months ago have failed little things business things relationship things it's been such a crap year what we tend to do is go fail 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 no that was all right <laughs> whereas what that that was all right should be increased 40 fold this year because one success is worth 20 not as successful because of covid yeah and that's where i think we should be at this year especially and i t and like if I, if anyone's been watching my social media another day another premiere as i post a picture <laughs> of myself looking fabulous on a red <laughs> carpet in front of us you know i am enjoying it and and i often say to my colleagues and uh, um, and to the people who've been making this movie with me, like we we will never have this opportunity again. And I'm not saying I believe without a doubt that we will make another big film again. Yeah, yeah. Um, but this is a unique. We need to make the most and enjoy every second. And I promise you, we are. But for sure, it has felt to me like all I've done is work harder for less. Yeah this year um really and everyone's been challenging to manage because everyone's having their own personal um crises and i'm working with a lot of musicians and they're quite hard to work with at the best of times no, i love you all but <laughs> and friends and family have been scared for themselves mm -hmm. and scared for others and worried and our government has been worried about our economy mm -hmm. and we're worried about the paycheck for tomorrow both for ourselves and for the country and Dude, you have come out of this with this amazing piece of art. Thank you. And I think that, you know, in, in this year, producing anything that is off the chain amazing would be like best picture Oscar quality any other year. You know, so I, I think what you've done is amazing. I think the documentary is amazing. Thank it's you. a really good watch. Everyone should get out and watch it. And so it's in the cinemas on the 26th. Yeah, and I think it's this total cinema experience because of the scale of that concert. Yeah, and, true. And um, what 660, because 660 had no creative say over this film. It's absolutely my interpretation. I mean, I shared it with them and I wanted their feedback. But, um, but what I love about it is that they gave me all their catalogue to play with, right? Oh, cool. So it's yeah, it was, my... actually, it was interesting watching the credits at the end. I watched right the way through at the end and seeing the list of 660 songs that are in that thing was huge. There was a lot of songs <laughs> and I had like a specific budget I had to fit in, you know? So I was like carefully managing the 30 second lots. Um, <laughs> But the the scale of that Western Springs show, so to be able to cut from that and that beautiful wire cam footage and everything and those that performance to these really intimate um, moments and and intimate acoustic performances, um, that is one of the things that I most enjoy about this film and the way that you, as a filmmaker, a storyteller, you can take music and lyrics and um, rhythm and vibe and turn that into narrative of an of, in and of itself um, on top of the pictures and the words, you know. So I, I, I feel proud of how that's come together in this movie. Yeah, it's amazing. Um, just before we go, because I know you've got to go catch up with another musician in Dunedin shortly. Um, I got what your takeaway from the movie was. When you showed this to the to the team from 660, uh unless you can't share um what what was their feedback and what was their takeaway from the movie um i th that they found it really emotional you know i think it was quite confronting um i showed them at the end of last year and it probably it kept tweaking but it was pretty sure. solid where yep. it was at the biggest the only thing that was um really stood out and i really did change because of what chris mack said oh my god it's like it looks looks really no fun to be in this fan julia you haven't put <laughs> enough of the fun stuff in and they were right and right. then we had a um 
test screening with an audience, um, which is just something you would always do mm -hmm. to get feedback. And they wanted a little bit more of the celebration and to know where they are today. And I think so that's made it perhaps a more rounded thing. Me, I would just hang out in all the lows and explore them as much as I can until I figure something out. But Listen to your 70s prod rock on the way I know, then. I know. I'm so funny. But... Um, but but there are some really cool um, performances in there which were for, for, for the film um, uh, that I think are beautiful. They shot beautifully mm -hmm. um, and um, I think, you know, make it a little bit of a Julia Parnell movie. Cool, man. <laughs> and look, I mean, I, I've, I've talked to you about two of your movies so far. I have to talk to you about, talk to you about the next 10. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, when you're sitting in that, that Oscar award type thing at some stage you don't forget us and we get a phone call and <laughs> you're setting the your sights for me you, you're no, manifesting you gotta, for me yeah you got it you're, you're talking about it you're talking about being challenged mm. um congratulations it's Thank a you. it's a really 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 good flick mm -hmm. it's enjoyable to watch I didn't get that sense of not fun enough um so I, whatever you tweaked it, it seemed to work um everyone should get out there and shout and you've just inspired me my my you saw my 14 year old as we were walking in. She's a nuts over music. Like I was, I'm a little bit happy. I know I pushed to try and get much or one of the boys to come in and they didn't. If he had of, or that one of them had of, and my 14 year old would have fainted, you know, because that's just what we were. We saw 660 with Ed Sheeran mm -hmm. uh, when he was in Dunedin. So yeah, huge fans. And so I think I will do that and take them along to the big screening mm -hmm. as well, because then they'll get to see it on the, on the big screen. Maybe next weekend, actually. That would be that amazing, because you know how important opening weekend is for setting the scene. Deal. <laughs> I, I will commit to that for next weekend, and I'll take my, um, whichever one of my kids want to go along, I'll take that. Actually, because that's another thing. It's a pretty safe movie yep. for, for all ages as well, for people yep. to know. Yeah, it is. Although, you know, there are moments, like I said, that, that balcony scene shocked me because I had never seen it before, and I was watching it going, Shit, we're focusing on balconies. Is something is one of them? Are we gonna? And then you actually see it. So there are some confronting moments as well. But brilliant, brilliant, brilliant! Congratulations again, and um, thanks for coming in. Thank you. Have a lovely day.